major role today. In the last video, we ended with a discussion of how Alexander's Hellenistic Empire crumbled in the wake of his death, his dream of a unified state bringing together the best of Eastern and Western cultures will quickly become a distant memory. What this will also create is a massive power vacuum in the Mediterranean region, and this will pave the way for the next major military might to arise, that of the Romans. Now, an interesting legend exists concerning the first settlement of the city of Rome. Mythology tells us that twin brothers, Romulus and Remus, who were the sons of Mars, the god of war, were abandoned as children in the wilderness. They were found by a she-wolf who, instead of killing them, actually looked after them and nurtured them with her own milk. They were later adopted by a human family and grew up into strong young men. Eventually, they set out on their own and decided to found a town. Romulus began to build protective walls on the Palatine Hill near the Tiber River, but his brother Remus began making fun of him. Apparently, sibling rivalry has always existed. He jeered at Romulus's hard work because the walls, he said, were too low to be of any use. He leaped over them to prove this, thus breaking the spell of the magic wall. Romulus rose up in anger and slaughtered his brother Remus. Romulus then continued building this new city, naming it after himself. Thus, Rome was born, in other words, in blood. And while this is just a mythological story, it's fictional, the Romans continued to circle back to this theme throughout their entire history, which I think is very instructive. Their civilization will honor the martial spirit, will celebrate strength above all else. And it's not coincidental that this origin story for the city of Rome really speaks to their championing of strength above all else. Regardless of its mythological founding, uh, what archaeologists and anthropologists tell us is that Rome actually was settled around the year 1000 BCE by migrants from northern Europe that crossed the Alps mountain range, probably seeking a warmer, more habitable climate. That they began to move down into the regions along the banks of the Tiber River and found that to be an ideal spot for agriculture. They began pasturing cows, pigs, and goats. They tended flocks of sheep, and even the rocky spots nearby were perfect for planting olive trees and citrus trees. Geographically speaking, you can see the so-called Italian Peninsula, the map that I have here on the slide. It looks a lot like a designer high-heeled boot kicking the island of Sicily. And if you want to know where the capital city of Rome is located, you go about mid-shin level on that boot, and you'll find Rome there along the banks of the Tiber River. Early Rome started out as a loose collection of farming villages. And the language that these early settlers spoke was a variant of the Celtic tongue, which we know now will develop into Latin. As for their government, for the Roman peoples, they did not like putting too much power in one person's hands, so instead they relied upon a council of elders, a group of older, well-respected men whose job it was to select tribal leaders and to also steer public policy over time. As Roman civilization began to develop, they started to catch the eye of a neighboring, much more powerful tribal group to the north of them, that being the Etruscans. And what will eventually take place is the Etruscans will invade their neighbors to the south, the Romans, successfully, and will come to dominate them for quite some time, between 750 and 509 BCE. During this period, the Romans will lose their independence. They will come under the Etruscan monarchy, and they are not happy about this turn of events. Despite this, the Roman people actually learned quite a bit technologically uh, in, in many ways from the Etruscans who were far more advanced than them in a number of ways. For example, uh, the Etruscans oversaw a number of new building projects in Rome, including paved roads and laying the foundations of what would later become known as the Forum. The Romans adopted Etruscan architectural details into their buildings like the vault and the arch. They adopted the dress style of the Etruscans, the famous toga or bedsheet look. Uh, gladiator contests 
are actually Etruscan in origin, as was the development of the twelve-month calendar and the use of a personal first name. And linguists believe that the Roman alphabet was perhaps an Etruscan adaptation of the Greek alphabet. Eventually, though, discontent grew among the native Romans, and they joined together with other Latin tribes in a large-scale rebellion against King Tarquin, which finally ended with Rome liberating itself in 509 B.C. Which brings us to the periodization of Roman history. As you can see on the slide, we sort of carve up this long stretch of Roman history into three distinct epochs. We've just been talking about the first phase of Etruscan domination. Now that they've liberated themselves, we're moving into phase two, that of the Roman Republic between 509 and 31 BCE, so named for the type of government that the newly independent Romans will implement. And then in a later lecture, we're going to talk about the transition from the Roman Republic to the third phase in Roman history, that of the empire. And unfortunately, that transition will be quite bloody. So as for Rome, after they liberated themselves from the Etruscans, what did Roman society look like? Well, actually, you have the Romans, just like all other human societies, uh, self-segregating into various socioeconomic classes. And here's where we have uh, a little bit of new vocabulary to master. We've talked about the nobility in ancient societies. Here in Roman civilization, we refer to the nobility, those of, that are very wealthy, typically only between about 5 to 10 percent of the entire population. We often refer to them as the patrician class in Rome. These are the large landowners. These are uh, wealthy and influential senators and politicians in Roman society. We'll talk more about their uh, influence in the political realm as we move forward. The plebeians, here's another new vocabulary term, the plebeians, think about that as the freedmen class. These are the rank and file Roman citizens, your artisans, your merchants, your farmers. These are the people whose labors make Rome function on a daily basis. And then, of course, also like other human civilizations, the Romans saw no problem in enslaving and, ex and exploiting their fellow human beings. The number of slaves will actually grow in Roman society over time as a direct result of their military conquest of other lands as they bring back increasing numbers of prisoners of war to perform the most menial, harshest uh, labor in Rome. Now, while the patrician class, or the nobility, was a small fraction of Rome's population, they tended to hold an outsized amount of power specifically uh, political power. How? Well, the patrician class maintained a tight grip on power in the city by gradually forbidding plebeians from even holding public office or participating in the government. The patrician class also controlled Roman politics by nominating consuls to govern, and they completely dominated the Senate. We're going to talk more about these different branches of Roman government here in just a moment. But just trying to give you an idea that very early on, we're going to start to see some tensions developing between the very wealthy patrician class maintaining this tight grip on power and the numerically superior but often disfranchised plebeian class that uh, resented naturally so. The idea that they were the driving force behind Rome's success, yet they had the least amount of say in their own governance. The second era of Roman history, known as the Roman Republic, gets its name for the type of government that Rome will establish for itself after shrugging off Etruscan domination for more than a century and a half. The Roman Republic is really modeled around the idea of having different branches of government, not vesting too much power in one single individual. As in the case of a monarchy, uh, in which you have rule by one, all decisions are made by one person, good or bad. For the Romans, they, f throughout their history, had kind of not really trusted giving too much power to one individual. And so when they create a republic, they will create various branches of government that will all share power. Building on that point, let's talk about the various branches of the Roman Republican form of government. We'll start with the position of consul or supreme leader of Rome. They served as judges and magistrates. They had some limited 
religious and judicial power, but in general the consul's power in civil government was somewhat limited. They could not declare war, for example. Uh, declaring war was the prerogative of another branch of the Roman government, that being the Senate. Once war was declared, however, because these consuls were commander-in-chief of the military, it was then up to them to prosecute that war successfully. Think about this as the executive branch of the government. Now, there were several limits placed on the power of these consuls because, again, the Romans were very suspicious of giving too much power to just one individual. So there were a couple of different ways in which Rome sought to, you know, maybe limit the damage if you end up with someone becoming consul who was unfit for the position. You don't have to have them in that position for very long. There's a term limit established for consuls. They can only serve one year at a time, then they must roll off. Now initially they could serve back-to-back -back terms, but that's like not having a term limit. So eventually the Romans figured out you need to let people sit on the sidelines for a period of 10 years. So you could serve one year as consul, then you had to wait a period of a decade before you could serve again. Another check or limit on the power of consuls was that they must always serve in pairs. You cannot have one serving alone at a time. Each consul had veto power over the other, meaning that you must have agreement for among the consuls for any you know, major policy to be advanced. The hope was that each consul would influence and moderate the views of the other. Let's take a look at another branch of Roman politics. Now I'm going to use um, sort of an umbrella term and talk about the assembly. This is the representative element in Roman politics. This is where the people of Rome get to elect representatives who will hopefully faithfully represent their interests and try to pass bills and implement measures to benefit the broader population. Now what I mean by an uh, umbrella term is there's a lot of different public assemblies. All right, so there's the Centuriate Assembly, there's the Tribal Assembly, there's the Plebeian Council. Uh, since this is not a class in Roman history specifically, we have to sort of uh, streamline things. So think about the assembly. What I mean by an umbrella term is that it actually consists of multiple different public assemblies, but I'm speaking about them as one unit right now just to kind of advance our discussion in a timely manner at least. All right, so the assembly, this is where the people as I said, have more of a voice. They get to elect representatives uh, if to further their interests. While all, all of this sounds promising for the plebeian class, here's a chance for them you know, to elect representatives to defend their interests. Almost all of these assemblies were still dominated by the patrician class or the rich noble class. For example, the Comitia Centuriata or the Centuriate Assembly was a ruling body that included representatives from all classes, richest to poorest in Rome, but in actuality, it was dominated by the wealthiest class due to its voting system, which favored the patricians who always voted first on all measures. This patrician-dominated body was also important because they voted in consuls. So in other words, you're seeing that the patrician class not only tends to dominate this branch of government, the assembly, the patrician class also has a large measure of influence over who will become consul. So in effect, the patrician class dominates not just the assembly, but they dominate the branch of government, uh, that of the consuls as well. Moving on, we will also see that the patrician class or the wealthy class, the nobility, will, will completely dominate the Senate. The Senate was an advisory council of elders who worked closely with the consuls to govern the city. And as I said just a moment ago, like in the assembly, the patrician class exercised the most power. In fact, the Senate was comprised mostly of just large landowners and the very wealthy. They are not voted into office. They have no term limits. There was no representation in the Senate early on by the poorer classes. As for their duties, senators were to debate issues and lay out policies that the consuls would normally follow. As a result of their power in nominating consuls, the Senate held much more power in ancient Rome than did the assembly. And in fact, if you want to think about the strongest of the three branches of government in Rome, it is the Senate under the Republic. The Senate is doing most of the heavy lifting and they are dominated by the patrician class. We will talk more about Rome's government in the second part of this lecture.